Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome you all here to uh, uh, today's seminar. Uh, very pleased to welcome uh, Dick Meserve. I'll say a little bit about uh, his uh, checkered history, uh, but uh, it, it starts with a confession that we go back to 1966 um, <laughs> when we uh, worked together at uh, AVCO uh, out here in Everett uh, on uh, supersonic chemical gas flowing lasers. And uh, all those supersonic blasts uh, took, their, took their toll on us, but uh, we've, we've man managed to survive. Uh, so Dick uh, is um, the uh, ninth president of the Carnegie Institute of Science in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and he went into that position, I think as many of you know, uh, from uh, his role as the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, where he served, uh, he spanned uh, the terms of Presidents uh, Clinton and, uh, and, and Bush. Uh, and obviously, you all know, I think, the responsibilities uh, of the commission in terms of uh, safe, particularly, particularly safe operation of, of, of nuclear power plants. Uh, Dick uh, got his uh, PhD in applied physics. Again, we were, again, I, we have many threads and we were students together at Stanford. Uh, Dick got his PhD in, in, uh, uh, in applied physics, uh, but then uh, following his uh, family tradition, uh, then went to uh, Harvard Law School uh, and, uh, and today uh, and all over these intervening uh, decades uh, has really become uh, one of the uh, most prominent uh, players, I think, in this, this intersection of, of technology, law, and, uh, and, uh, and public policy. Um, uh, he's, you know, lots of stuff we could say, uh, you can read in his, in his CV, a member of the National Academy of Engineering, um, uh, and a foreign member of the Russian, Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, etc. Uh, more recently, uh, again, we served, we had the pleasure of serving together again on something, the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future that provided a report last, uh, last year. So that's kind of, you know, a, a quick run through some, uh, some of his uh, 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 roles, responsibilities over the years. I'll just say a couple of other things to add a little maybe flavor uh, to it. Uh, uh, I mentioned his legal career, and he was a clerk, uh, among other things, a clerk for uh, uh, Justice Blackmun uh, in, the, in the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, he tells me his most lasting uh, piece of work was in Bates versus the Arizona State Bar, uh, which uh, said that attorneys uh, could, in fact, advertise their services, uh, yielding a permanent wound to American civilization. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Dick is also uh, uh, a very, very active uh, in uh, academy uh, activities, uh, reviews, reports. Uh, he also uh, says that he, for example, he chaired uh, for the Academy's, the uh, post-Chernobyl uh, DOE review of its Class A facilities, uh, leading, as he has said, to the preservation of Russian reactors and the shutdown of American reactors uh, in, in response to this review. So he's been a great public servant, uh, and, uh, uh, but really uh, uh, seriously emphasize that Dick really is one of the very trusted uh, people in the Washington environment uh, in terms of giving objective, straightforward, technically grounded advice with a strong legal background and contributing in, in, in many, many ways, some seen and some unseen uh, to, our, to our public policy. Today, he was, he's going to talk on the future of nuclear power. Uh, just point out that I thought our copyright on that lasted more than 10 years, uh, but apparently not. Uh, so, <laughs> Dick, future of nuclear power. Well, I thought that the title would resonate at uh, MIT, so, Oops. so um, it, it, it definitely resonated at MIT, uh, and so I, I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here, and thank you for your generous introduction. Uh, if I had been forewarned, I would have thought about various stories about Ernie to retaliate, and uh, you'll have to invite me back again so I will have that opportunity. Uh, as I've indicated, I'm going to tell you something about my views of the future of nuclear power. Uh, this lecture could be worse. I could, could be talking about the past of nuclear power. Uh, I think there really is a future, which is a lesson that will be uh, coming out of this lecture. Uh, 
just to set the stage, uh, the as indicated on the slide, nuclear power is a very significant source of electricity generation. It's, it should be 14 percent of the world's electrical power generation. Obviously, there are other sources of power. And that occurs through 435 or so reactors in 31 countries plus Taiwan. Um, there is a common view that as a result of Fukushima that basically things have shut down. and. Although it's clear that there has been an impact on aspirations with regard to nuclear power after Fukushima. In fact, there's a lot going on. And part of the thrust of this talk is to discuss the variability in where activities are occurring that relate to nuclear power around the world. There are about 65 or so reactors that are under construction around the world and a large number more. You can get a wide variety of numbers as to what those that are being planned. Uh, the variety is, is there are a large number of countries that have sort of stuck their toe in the water as they're thinking about nuclear power, and some of them will proceed and many will not. But the basic message I'm going to have is that there's a lot of variability around the world on the approach of and attitudes toward nuclear power, and that is going to pose some policy challenges for the United States. I'm going to spend a little bit of time, more time than I will than the others, about where we're headed in the United States. Um, the NRC commonly says we have 104 operating reactors. What they mean is there are 104 reactors that are licensed for operating. Uh, there are uh, several that are now actually not operating for various reasons. And as we'll come to what's going to happen with a few of those is a little bit uncertain right now. But basically, we have the largest nuclear fleet in the world. And it provides about 19% of our total electrical power. Because that varies greatly by region. There are some regions that are highly dependent on nuclear power and others that are not. Uh, the Energy Information Agency, government entity, uh, has just recently uh, provided its latest update on its projections for energy usage in the United States. And they project that there will be about a 14% growth in the amount of electrical power that is generated through re by reactors by uh, 2040. Because there's going to be so much additional growth that they anticipate in energy, in fact, the contribution that nuclear makes as a share of our total production will be uh, reduced from about 19% today to about 17% of total power by 2040. I'm talking again about electrical power. I'm not talking about total energy usage. Uh, and you may wonder, well, gee, how in the world are we going to meet that projection? And there are four, four self-evident ways. One is power up rates at existing reactors. In fact, we have gotten about 20 gigawatts of capacity that currently is online that was not initially licensed. At the NRC, uh, we had a, a lot of experience that developed over the years with reactors and some of the initial designs, as it turned out, were very conservative. And with further analysis, it could justify and establish that safety margins would be maintained if uh, uprates in power were allowed. And some of them, it was as simple as uh, adding additional flow meters, that the power output of the reactor is uh, monitored by temperature and the flow of, of hot water from the reactor, and you got a more accurate f flow meter. They, the NRC could give you credit for that, uh, that you had a more uh, uh, robust measurement of power and they could allow you to go up in power. That they had a, compensated for the fact that there was some inaccuracy in the previous measure. A lot of the power up rates were the result of uh, licensees deciding that it was much cheaper to come in and replace the component, the structure that was inhibiting their capacity to go up in power and to add, make additional retrofits to the plant that would justify it. Now, obviously, all of these require license amendments that were, uh, that were reviewed by the NRC to assure that safety margins were uh, achieved. But they've been a substantial contributor. As I say, about 20 gigawatts have come out of, of 100, have our current uh, 100 or so gigawatts of capacity that are grain had come out of the fact that the power up rates have been allowed. And those will continue. That uh, low-hanging fruit has probably been achieved, but there are still opportunities for growth 
that presumably will be some of the companies will take advantage of, and that will contribute to achieving this growth in power capacity over the period to 2040. The other possibility is improved capacity factors. Unfortunately, from the viewpoint of getting more out of the reactors, there isn't much further we can go. Uh, sort of 20 years ago, capacity factors for nuclear plants were around 60% or so. Uh, nowadays, the fleet average is a little over 90%. Uh, since you have to bring the reactors down occasionally for refueling, uh, that you know, you're getting close to what the theoretical maximum is for uh, capacity factors. So there's some room. Uh, no doubt the companies have lots of interest in being able to keep plants online. And so improved capacity factors is a possible contributor, but there's probably not much you can get there. The obvious way to be able to generate that 14% of additional power is from new construction and from license renewal. Uh, at the moment, there are five plants under construction in the United States. Watts Bar is an old plant that had previously licensed that their TVA is completing. Uh, the new plants that are proceeding under a, the brand new licensing process uh, uh, that the NRC follows now are being put in place, built in South Carolina and Georgia, two units at, uh, at uh, each at two sites. Uh, I say it's a new process that, in fact, has been in place for a while, but these are the first plants in which that process has been fully exercised to develop a certified design. And these are the four uh, generation three plus, which is the most modern plants that people are building today, are our uh, Westinghouse uh, AP1000 design. Um, and uh, you know those plants will come online if all goes well in towards the end of this decade. We will not have any other new construction that will occur in this decade. Uh, and there are significant barriers to new construction. The biggest, I think, problem right now is from the viewpoint of those who would like to see more nuclear is our natural gas prices. It's uh, natural gas prices where they are is a real threat to all other uh, electrical generation technology. I mean that nothing can beat natural gas other than some of the low handing fruit in the efficiency area. Uh, it turns out that many of the renewables have some other legal advantages that they're able to exploit uh, that encourages the construction of wind and solar. Uh, they include uh, portfolio standards. Uh, as an example, California requires that 30% of the electrical generation in that state has to be from renewable sources by 2020. So that means that the companies have to just go out and build a lot of renewable plants. Uh, and they have a lot of wind in California. It just happens to blow at the wrong, wrong time. So they're actually building a lot of solar, which is more expensive, but at least comes in at the time when they need power. But that is a, uh, that's an attractive approach to bring in these technologies. One should understand that it is, in fact, an implicit subsidy for those technologies, and that it's an easy subsidy because it looks at first glance that this comes for free. You just tell them to produce it. But in fact, obviously, it has to feed into the rate base. And in California, they have very high electrical prices because of this. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying that this is something that nuclear doesn't get the benefit of and why we see some construction of wind and solar at a time when natural gas is the economic decision that would be made in a completely level playing field. The other challenge for nuclear is it's just basically very expensive. The, uh, the other uh, report on the future of nuclear energy in 2003 had estimated, the MIT study, had estimated about $2,000 a kilowatt. And there was some criticism in the industry that that was way too high. Uh, and of course, in retrospect, people just wish that they could build nuclear plants at that cost. Now, the real expected cost today would be more closer to $5,000 a kilowatt for production of nuclear. And so it's just, the, of course, nuclear plants, the big expense is building a plant and amortizing that cost over the life of the plant in some fashion. So you have a very large unit cost that, that is a difficult burden that has to be borne. Uh, the other burden, I'd say a high capital burden, is something that is sort of unique to the United States in that 
are, we have a very fractured market of generating companies. Uh, that, you know, some of the largest generating companies, uh, Exelon being an example, has a total market capitalization of around $35 billion. Uh, and you ask them to take on the burden of a, of a $6 billion, $6 or $8 billion plant, and even the largest company has to pause. And the reason is, is if there is a cost overrun or a delay, the company's in the ditch, is that you just have huge expenses you have to bear and you don't have a balance sheet that would enable you to carry it. So you have a, a, a large capital burden that is something you have to overcome for these. So there's a lot of headwinds that, uh, that nuclear has to overcome in order to encourage new construction uh, in the United States. So the only thing that's left is license renewal, and that isn't that's why it doesn't give you new capacity, at least it enables you to sustain the capacity you have. The Atomic Energy Act uh, provides that nuclear plants will have a 40-year life with the possibility of license renewal, an extension of that life. The 40 years wasn't based on any technical decision by the Congress when the Atomic Energy Act was passed. It was based on the idea, then the view that people had at the time, was that nuclear would be so inexpensive that a company that was running a nuclear plant would have a huge economic advantage, and they shouldn't allow that advantage to be sustained over a long period of time, because these companies would just become so wealthy as a result of having a nuclear fleet. Because the economics of nuclear, as I've indicated, have changed or different from the expectations at the time. Um, the NRC established a process to allow this a renewal of the license, extension of the license to occur in up to 20-year increments. And it turns out that of a fleet of 104 units, we have about 70 units that have already received a license extension that will allow them to proceed for a life of 60 years. And there are a bunch of others that are pending. The, uh, the problem is that, uh, is that even with the life extension, given the age of the fleets, about 45% of the current capacity is going to be going offline, will have reached a 60-year life by 2040. So there's going to be a real challenge, and I don't know the basis where EIA came up with the notion that we would be able to have a growth in power generation by 2040. Other than that, they have made certain assumptions about the opportunity for plants to take a second license extension that might allow them to extend their lives for up to 80 years. Now, the license renewal process that the NRC examines is very much focused on basically the passive structures at the plant. They have the notion that all the active equipment, I mean, all the pumps and uh, measuring devices, invisible pipes, all that stuff is under constant examination and rebuilt motors and so forth. They're all being rebuilt and replaced all the time. And that the, the, the ordinary process of license review takes care of that. So what they're trying to look at in license renewal is the things that they don't regulate explicitly as part of the normal operation of the plant. So they're worried about things like the deterioration of the concrete. What's happening to all those cables that are buried and are inaccessible? You can't monitor easily what's happening on them. Similarly with piping that's buried and which you're not monitoring. There's a whole series of issues like that. And of course, uh, the, you have obviously challenges with a reactor pressure vessel that uh, you need to be monitoring. And is it going to be one that you can continue to operate safely for an additional 20 years? Uh, the NRC has not been asked to review any uh, plant for a, an additional 20 years yet. There is a major effort that's underway with the industry and at the Department of Energy to try to evaluate and do the research that's necessary to be able to lay a foundation for licensees to go to the NRC and make the case that an additional 20 years uh, of life is possible. But if we're going to achieve the EIEA, uh, projection, uh, something's going to have to happen. Either there have to be a resurgence of, of construction uh, after the, this decade, which is possible, 
uh, and we'll come back to what some of the tools that might be needed, or uh, that you have to definitely would have to have license extension to just even stay where you are. Now, this is not to say that uh, there aren't additional threats uh, to nuclear that are being incurred now. I mentioned earlier that uh, natural gas prices are low. And that is posing a threat for some existing plants. The Kiwani plant in Wisconsin is a site that had one 500 megawatt reactor operated by Dominion Power. And they recently decided, as their power purchase agreements ran out, and they saw that they were going to have to sell power into a spot market with very low prices as a result of a competitive uh, natural gas power that the plant did not make economic sense to continue. They tried to uh, see if they could sell it. No one would take it. And so they've announced that that plant is going to shut down. Um, similarly, and this is a somewhat different story, there was the Crystal River plant, which is another plant on the order of 500 megawatts in Florida that has prese presented some challenges because of cracks in the concrete and the containment, was confronted with a very substantial bill to uh, enable that plant to restart as a result of the, uh, of the correcting the problems with the concrete and the containment. And they, uh, last week, decided to call it a day. And the Crystal River plant will similarly be decommissioned. So plants that people might well have been willing to invest in have been, people have been cautious in this market climate uh, to make the investments to keep these plants running. And there may be some others we'll hear about. There's been speculation in the press about other sites that are on the edge economically as to whether they will continue to live in this market. Because we're not going to have these natural gas prices forever, and you have studied that here at MIT. But it's very hard for a company today when they see that this, these prices are being sustained and they're losing money on these plants to just decide to keep them operating, and particularly if they have to make big investments in them to keep them running as at Crystal River. The other thing that is an overhang right now is that as a result of the Fukushima accident, the NRC is contemplating a large number of new regulatory requirements. In fact, they've in implemented a large number of them already. Uh, and the question is going to be how far are they going to go? Um, some of the retrofits that are at least under consideration are ones that could be quite expensive uh, to implement. There will be a call from the NRC as to whether the safety issues that have come to the fore after Fukushima require that uh, adjustment. Uh, the NRC will go through a process of evaluating the, the cost benefit of, the, uh, of those changes as part of their process. But if the, and if the risk reduction is not, is just too, uh, it ends up to be uh, one that can be justified based on the cost, they'll, they'll order the changes. But in this, this market, one doesn't know how that is going to work. And for some companies, that may also be a threat to the continuing life of these plants. I also mentioned the reinvigorated challenges to nuclear power. And what I'm th talking there about is about the reaction to Fukushima, is that, in fact, the polling that I have seen would suggest that the general public is about where they were before the Fukushima accident. About 60% of the public believes that we should build more nuclear power plants. And that's about what the number was before the Fukushima accident. What has changed, I believe, and will affect things, is that the portion of the public that is most anti-nuclear has now been galvanized again to uh, step up their opposition. And so license renewals that had gone through without interventions are now going to be challenged. Uh, the efforts to get licenses for new plants are certainly going to be subject to litigation. So you're in a different uh, legal environment, which means that you're going to have to run the gauntlet before, uh, before the NRC and these processes, and that's going to be something that a rational lic potential licensee would weigh in deciding whether to proceed. There are obviously some changes as well. I don't mean to be too glum about things. 
uh, there are a lot of plants that are that are out there that are making money because even with low natural gas prices, they are producing cheap electric power. They're running well. They don't have the kinds of problems at Crystal River. But if you think about policy changes that could come that would uh, encourage uh, uh, nuclear power, I mean, one obvious one is to start to price the uh, environmental impacts of carbon and through some kind of a mechanism where the, the, uh, the generation sources that produce carbon are paying for the social cost that they're imposing on everyone for what they're doing. From my point of view, climate change is a hugely important issue and that a rational balancing of the risk of nuclear against the risk of climate change, in my view, no rational person could choose to not build nuclear power plants as part of the response. Obviously, it has to be done safely, but others are going to make different judgments on that. And it's obviously quite controversial politically right now to uh, try to deal with the greenhouse gas problem. One other thing that's a little bit uh, less, uh, maybe a little bit less challenging, but would also be unlikely to occur in the near term, is to at least have neutrality among the, uh, the carbon-free generation technologies. And we have a situation now, as I mentioned earlier, where there are portfolio standards, there are various federal tax credits of various kinds that are available for renewables that aren't available for, for nuclear. And it would be appropriate if going to carbon-free generation is your objective to at least have neutrality among the various options for achieving it. And so that would be something that may be a little less hard than, than uh, carbon-free generation. But again, that doesn't seem likely in the to encourage carbon-free generation. That doesn't seem very likely in the near term. The one new technical idea that has been uh, very much on the screen of people today is the idea of building small modular reactors. Uh, these are reactors that sort of 300 megawatts or so and, or less. Uh, that's sort of the size at which one can build the reactor and put it on a train car or a, a large truck and be able to ship it to a site. Um, and this is something that has been supported by the Department of Energy. It turns out we have a lot of experience in building small modular reactors. It's what we put in submarines. And so um, Babcock and Wilcox, which is the prime contractor for the nuclear power plants for submarines, has got a design that they're pushing forward, uh, among many others who are in this field, to produce small modular reactors. Now, the normal idea has been as the plants, as the technology has advanced, the plants have gotten larger and larger. That's just spread the overhead cost associated with all the safety equipment over a larger base of power. The different approach that small modular reactors hope to capture is efficiencies in costs that come from factory production. Uh, that they think if they can produce a large number of them in a factory, they'll get learning curve advantages in, the, in, the, in, the, in their production. And that building things in factories are basically going to be cheaper than the sort of stick built sorts of construction that we'd otherwise do. And they will find a way to drive down the costs uh, in that fashion and make small modular reactors attractive. Uh, it's something that is of interest now in the Department of Energy for many reasons, including the fact that uh, these are reactors that would be, have the promise perhaps of being American built and could be competitive around the world. They're of a size that sort of fits into grids of various uh, sizes around the world that not everyone can uh, take a, a, a gigawatt reactor and has a grid that could sustain that. So that around the world you have an export possibility with a reactor that might be a more appropriate size. In terms of US companies, the fact that it's, although the unit cost will be less, means it's more sustainable on balance sheets of the size that's typical of generating companies in the US. So there are lots of ways in which this could work, but huge uncertainty at the moment as to whether this trade-off of size versus the trade-off of factory manufacturing, the benefit, whether how that's going to work, whether you really can achieve uh, the learning curves that you anticipate. And of course, in order to achieve those learning curves, you need to have a large order book, justify building the factory. So if we're going to do this, this is going to be something that's going to require at least substantial government assistance to sort of prime the pump. 
and to have this go forward. It's not clear that we have the budget capacity to do that today. Well, let me move on. Uh, <clears throat> everyone has the impression that Europe is turning away from nuclear power. There's a lot of commentary about uh, Germany. Uh, Italy has flip-flopped on nuclear. After Chernobyl, they turned away from nuclear. They were sort of nudging back into the field again. And then after the Fukushima accident, they've said no. Uh, Belgium and Switzerland, that both have operating reactors, are, are similarly sort of backing out, uh, talking about backing away from the reactors. <clears throat> but there is new construction that's taking place, most notably in France. Uh, there is uh, uh, you know, new, uh, yet another new reactor that is contemplated in Finland. They have a, a large EDF reactor that is a Riva reactor that is under construction now, uh, not EDF. Uh, and UK has got a whole bunch of reactors that are going to have to be decommissioned. They're talking about uh, major new construction uh, projects there as well. And sort of unseen by a lot of people is there's a lot of construction that's contemplated in Eastern Europe. Uh, that Czech Republic, which has some reactors, uh, Poland, uh, and so forth are all, Lithuania, there's a whole series of countries that are contemplating new construction. Uh, the, ba the net of all this is that the projections are that, that at best, Europe will sort of stay even in terms of the contribution that nuclear makes to power in the European area. Japan, of course, is the country where there's been the most dramatic change. Uh, before Fukushima, they had 54 reactors, provided about 30% of their power. And they had plans, government plans, to have a lot of new construction and go up to 50% of their power. For the Japanese, it's a situation where they have no indigenous energy sources. And they saw that, uh, that reactors were, quite frankly, a vehicle for their energy security, their national security, really, to rely on reactors. As a result of the Fukushima accident, everything came down. Um, of course, obviously, there are four reactors that are never going to restart. So of the remaining 50, only two are operating today. Uh, we have a situation in Japan where there's a total collapse in public support. For understandable reasons, the Japanese public does not trust the government, and it doesn't trust the nuclear industry. And so it's a very death spiral that they've had in terms of public relations, uh, in terms of confidence in nuclear power that it'll be hard to turn around. And <clears throat> the result of this is that the Japanese are spending billions of dollars for replacement fuel. Uh, they have, uh, this is a result of the Fukushima accident, although there are very few health impacts, that, uh, if any, uh, as a result of nuclear exposures Many people, of course, were displaced, and they have a huge cleanup problem that will add to their economic woes. This could change. It's going to be difficult to change. The new government is allegedly pro-nuclear and would like to find a way to start the plants. It's looking to its economy. It has otherwise obviously been in a very difficult strait for more than a decade and sees the penalty that comes from not having these power plants online, would like to get them started. And the interesting thing is that they have an informal system in Japan, it's not legally required, that when a plant goes down even for refueling, they get approval from the prefecture governor in order to allow the restart to occur. And after Fukushima accident, you can imagine the situation the prefecture governor is in. Uh, this is a person who presumably doesn't know a whole lot about nuclear power. Uh, the public uh, has an opposition to nuclear power and is gravely concerned. And that governor can't look to the federal licensing authority and ask whether this is appropriate. Certainly can't look to the utility company. And he's got no political cover to ever allow these plants to restart. Uh, and interestingly, that's changing because they're seeing the economic consequences of all these plants being down and, quite frankly, an absence of power that uh, they have. Uh, and so many of the prefecture governors are finally starting to talk and go along with the central government in at least encouraging the idea that some of these plants should restart. Obviously, it's all in a context that there has to be confidence that they will be safely operated. There is a new regulator uh, in Japan. 
the Nuclear Regulatory uh, Authority, NRA. Uh, it is a whole new uh, regulatory system, a very flawed system before where the regulator was part of the Ministry for Economic Trade and Industry was basically under the thumb of the regulated community. So they have a very weak regulator that incidentally had been subject to wide criticism by the IEA before Fukushima. Japanese have finally decided they should do something about it and they've created an independent regulator. Uh, and the regulator was under guidance that it was to introduce new regulatory requirements by July of this coming year. And they just got started, you know, in the fall. I am an advisor to that regulator, but I felt though I've had a limited interaction with them. Uh, some of their staff came to visit me yesterday with their outline of the regulations, um, which I can tell you are more expansive in their scope than anything anyone else in the world has or is contemplating as a result of the Fukushima accident. And it's compounded by the fact that they do not intend to apply something that the NRC calls a backfit rule, which is that things that aren't uh, required to provide adequate assurance of safety, you still can require of licensees if there is this balance of risk reduction and cost that justifies that requirement. So there's an evaluation of the costs. The Japanese intention is to not make any uh, accommodations of that type. And they, as I was briefed yesterday, they intend to take all these requirements, say they all must, all the plants must come into full compliance with all the requirements before they will be allowed to restart. Um, for some of these plants, no doubt that's going to be impossible. <clears throat> I'm sure for many it will be economically uh, prohibitive. And it certainly will take a long time because there's a lot of of construction and retrofits that would be required. So I think it's going to be an interesting situation. You have a situation where the economy, the central government, wants to go off in one direction, and you have a regulator that is, uh, uh, is, is headed in a somewhat different direction. Obviously, the plants have to be safe. The question is whether the pendulum is swinging too far in Japan. But it's going to be interesting to see where this heads up. At the moment, uh, two plants operating, and even those two plants, are subject to some question as to whether there's some seismic vulnerability that will allow them to continue. So a very uncertain picture in Japan, although I think that the prognosis is not good, <coughs> that plants will be restarted in the near term. This is in great contrast to the rest of Asia. There was certainly a slowdown after uh, Fukushima, and the plans have gotten scaled back, both because of Fukushima and because of what's happening in the world economy, particularly in China. Uh, in their own economy. But there's a huge surge of construction that's underway and it's unplanned. And I have some of the, some of the data that's there uh, that's, that's underway. The Chinese have a, are building a couple of the AP-1000s. In fact, they're ahead of the US construction of the Westinghouse plant. But a large number of the plants that they are constructing are their own indigenous design, which is an older design. Uh, so that they've got a, 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 s a whole series of things that they plan, and it's not altogether clear what they're going to do. They have one gas reactor that they uh, contemplate as uh, being built. Uh, the, uh, but as you see, it's just huge activity, <clears throat> although even somewhat diminished by Fukushima, huge activity in Asia outside of Japan. Russia uh, has an aggressive nuclear program. As you can see, they have 33 operating reactors, uh, 10 under construction, and grand plans for a lot more. Um, the Russians are very enthusiastic about their nuclear technology. Uh, the interesting dimension of Russia is that they are proving to be a very effective vendor of, rea of reactors, that the reactors that are going to go into Vietnam, too, uh, are of Russian design. Uh, they are selling a lot of reactors into uh, Eastern Europe. In fact, of the reactors I mentioned, that the largest percentage of the reactors under construction now are Russian reactors. Uh, and they can price very attractively. Uh, and uh, so it's a, they are an interesting, important international player with regard to how they're proceeding. Uh, the most, to me, the most interesting development 
is that I mentioned earlier there are 31 countries that currently have nuclear power plants, uh, and there are going to be a whole lot more uh, over the next decade to two decades. That there are active programs for construction underway in the list of countries I have there. I was in the UAE in the early fall and went out in the desert, uh, and they've got two very large reactors being built by the Koreans that are there, uh, that are well underway, uh, with a whole these all these other countries and many others that are either have uh, uh, plans for firm plans for construction or contracts even, and a lot of others are putting the whole infrastructure in place to be able to proceed. Fewer than before Fukushima, but still a meaningful number that have indicated an intention to proceed. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the next decade we see at least seven or eight powers that do not have nuclear power plants today that will acquire one. Now, that, to my mind, poses a whole series of special challenges. One of them is just assuring that the plants are operated safely. Uh, now, they aren't going to use indigenous designs. They're going to buy their reactors from a foreign vendor. And presumably, they'll have a lot of hand-holding in the early years of operation. But there is no infrastructure that exists in these countries today with uh, nuclear experience. So you have a situation with, you know, you have a, even developed countries uh, with nuclear power plants have found it very difficult to establish an appropriate safety culture. And we learned a lot from the accidents about how to do this right. And you go into these countries and the attitudes towards safety, and many of them are quite different. They have no technology that is uh, in operation in their economies that is anywhere near as sophisticated. Uh, and you have a whole infrastructure of education of people and attitudes towards safety that you'd have to ingrain in them to achieve this, uh, do this job in the way you should do it. Uh, and I have found in my conversations with them that it is quite difficult to get through to them the nature of the responsibilities that they have to accept if they're going to proceed. That in a certain sense they think it's a developed country, me, they see me of course as an American, trying to tell them how hard this is as a way to discourage them from doing something that we do. And that's a hard message to deliver. Uh, there also, of course, is security problems that have to be confronted at these, at these sites. Uh, I would just note that I've talked about many of these plants being in the Middle East uh, that are contemplated. And so you're talking about plants in parts of the world that are unstable, uh, where there are active terrorist groups. And <clears throat> so you have, a, you have to confront the security issues of these plants with they really may confront uh, as serious problems. Of course, there are also proliferation-related issues that have to be confronted. Now, these are one of the inevitable <coughs> consequences of more nuclear power plants is you need enrichment capability. And where is that going to be? And if you've got enrichment capability, then you have the capacity to generate highly enriched uranium, even though, obviously, highly enriched uranium is not going to be used in the nuclear power plant that the same technology is, can easily be extended to produce weapons usable material. And then you have the question of what happens with the spent fuel. And one would not expect that any of these countries would have an interest in reprocessing. But in the event that they were to decide that it's in their, that in their interest to do so, then there's a, obviously a possibility for the diversion of plutonium and yet another weapons usable material. So you have all these countries, new countries, that are coming in. It's not clear in all cases exactly what their motivation is. Uh, for many of them, I think it's sort of like national airlines, that they could demonstrate they're part of the club in the developed world by having them. One does wonder a little bit about whether a, as an anchor to windward would at least have some familiarity with nuclear technology in the event that their neighbors were to proceed in a weapons program and they needed to catch up themselves. One worries in the Middle East with Iran and their other countries' attitudes about Iran as to what motivates them, actually. But in any event, the safeguards issue is going to become a lot more complicated because there are going to be many more players that one has to worry about that are involved whose attitudes may not be aligned. It almost certainly will not be aligned with, in all things, 
uh, with the West. So that, what are the implications of all of this? Uh, I think it's clear that reliance on nuclear power will grow. We're going to have more nuclear power in more countries. And with that is going to become these challenges that I've mentioned on safety, security, and nonproliferation. I think it's also inevitable that the center of gravity for civilian nuclear power is going to move to Asia. That we have a situation uh, where we have a lot of this new construction is in Asia. Jap the Chinese are not yet seeking to be exporters of nuclear power, but that can't be far away. That that occurs, the Russians already are exporters of, uh, of nuclear power, and I'm including for this purpose that Russia and Asia together. So I think that you have to confront a world in which the influence of the United States in Europe is going to decline. If we're not part of the game in the nuclear power world, as, uh, as maybe the trajectory we're headed in both Europe and the US, it's going to be hard to set the rules. Uh, and particularly where you have foreign vendors that are going to become from some of these countries. If the Chinese <coughs> start selling, Indians aren't going to be far behind. So you have, a, you have a situation where the dynamic here is one that's going to be particularly challenging for us to keep a safe, secure, and weapons-free world. Um, more distant future, I am optimistic. Uh, about, in the sense of nuclear power, I'm not optimistic about where we're headed on climate change. Uh, we are, the signal is going to become increasingly strong. It's going to become a political necessity for people to confront it. And the problem is going to be is that that recognition politically is just likely to occur too late for us to avoid having to make, around the world, having to make very serious problems and confront very serious problems that result from climate change. Uh, you know, this, the wealthy countries may be able to adapt in various ways, the poor countries will suffer uh, with all the implications that that has uh, you know, for, uh, for national security. I <clears throat> also believe, and I'm somewhat out on a limb on this, is that light water reactor technology is the technology to displace. It is the, going to be the technology of choice, I think, for the indeterminate future. Somebody who's investing billions of dollars in a nuclear plant doesn't want a science experiment. They're going to want something that they're confident they understand and work, assured that they can get licensed in a reasonable time frame. If you're going to incorporate a revolutionary technology to displace light water reactors, you have to be able to demonstrate some really significant advantages. And I think there's a whole complex set of considerations as to what those advantages are that you'd have to demonstrate. Uh, they include, obviously, greatly improved safety would be valuable, that people would value, reduce cost, ease of security. Uh, I talk uh, here about waste minimization. I don't really mean minimization. I mean having a fuel cycle where the waste challenge is uh, significantly reduced. Uh, proliferation is obviously a concern that would be valuable to incorporate. Uh, you know, we get to these larger and larger power plants. They don't fit in the grids very easily, particularly in small countries. That's going to be an attractive uh, feature. Uh, new applications, you need high, process, high, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> high temperature uh, uses of nuclear power for processes purposes. You might want to go to a different technology. And obviously, uh, long, long term, some resource conservation is a possible argument. There's a lot of uranium today that makes that uh, not a serious concern at the moment. And I say that there's a whole bunch of things that could be brought to the table that would encourage one to make a very radical change. But you have the problem that once you have an entrenched technology for light water reactors, it is going to be very hard to displace it. So that's probably what the technology we're going to live with, both here and around the world in the way I've described, on into the future. It's possible that other things will emerge, but it's going to have an uphill fight. Uh, that isn't to say that we can't do better with light water reactor technology. There's certainly things that are underway around the world and here at MIT uh, to try to incorporate various changes in light water technology that will make those plants safer and more efficient. So that's uh, a quick survey of the future of nuclear power. Uh, I suspect that the 
nuclear aficionados in the room have not heard much that is new. I hope there's at least a few people who've heard something they hadn't learned before. So thank you very much. I am happy to take some questions. <clears throat> well, uh, you were mentioning that we're stuck with light water reactors. Uh, do you dismiss the idea of gas-cooled combined cycle reactors, which could give you more than one and a half times the power for the same infrastructure? Do you think that's just too far out? No, I don't dismiss any of it. I mean, I, if I were DOE, I would be investing in advanced reactor technology. Uh, I would just recognize at the outset that displacing light water reactors is going to be hard unless you can demonstrate that you have significant advantages in at least some of the areas that I've mentioned here. And, uh, you know, maybe gas reactors, high temperature gas reactors is uh, something that, that might, uh, which are further along. Uh, uh, might be uh, something that ends up being attractive and could play a major role. The Chinese, for example, seem they're building one, and they have one that they're running now. That's right. They seem to be quite disenchanted with second-generation reactors, and have been consistently falling short of their declaratory plans, while they look for something better, and they don't know what it is yet. Yep. That's right. I mean, there is, I think, multiple factors that are occurring in China that their economic growth is much less than they had anticipated. And so with that has come reduced expectations for what the power demand will be. And so there, there, I'm sure there are factors beyond uh, the pure question of whether they like the technology or not that are explaining why the Japanese, excuse me, I keep on saying the Japanese, the Chinese are backing off their earlier plans that had been premised on a growth scenario that isn't occurring and is unlikely to occur. But nonetheless, they clearly are, uh, have uh, great interest in their gas reactor technology. They, I know they bought a lot of the IP from Germany. Uh, and you know they have a small 10 megawatt reactor. I think that I think it's order of 10 megawatts that's operating at Shenzhen uh, at the Tsinghua. What's the name of the big technical university? It's at, uh, and they're now uh, preparing to proceed with a commercial size reactor. Please. Uh, would the licensing process would be significantly different for modular nuclear reactors because they are made to standard sizes? Would it speed it up, the, the regulatory process for licensing? Well, the whole idea of the, 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 yeah. the question is, is whether the licensing process would be easier for standardized reactors. And that actually is the whole premise that exists behind the um, what's called Part 52 of the NRC regulations, where the idea was a vendor would come in and obtain a certified design for a nuclear power plant from the NRC, and with the idea that they'd have no orders for that power plant as they come to the NRC and could have it fully reviewed and at the end of the day have that design certified. And then all the issues that were resolved by the NRC in that process would not be reopened later. So then uh, somebody who wants to build a plant would, could come in and would have to demonstrate all the site requirements that are associated with it, would have to show that what it's doing, the, the threats to the reactor are ones that are within the envelope that was certified, but that you then, all of that chunk that has to do with the reactor would all be, have been handled beforehand and the risk associated with whether the NRC would give a license would all be resolved before you put a lot of money into building a plant. That's in contrast with the existing process where there, where all the existing plants were, ish, were built with a construction permit was a rather light examination of the technical issues. And after it was built, to get an operating license, it was a much more thorough examination and, of course, the possibility of very expensive retrofits after the plant was built that the NRC would require for safety reasons. Some of which, of course, they did after Three Mile Island. So the idea of the process, of the process change, was to provide some assurances and some efficiencies. Please. Yeah. Well, if you want uh, neutrality in uh, new uh, non-carbon energy production, we should repeal Price-Anderson, shouldn't we? That's a ten-year subsidy that's turned into a virtually permanent subsidy for the nuclear industry. Well, I mean, you could, you're going to have a debate. Uh, 
as to whether it's a subsidy or not. Um, you know the the. the well, why don't you say a word about what Price Anderson is. Uh, what there is is Price Anderson has a is a requirement that if there is a serious nuclear accident, that the liability of the uh, the companies will be limited. All of the lawsuits that would arise get centralized in a single court, and there is a process where where the whole industry gets taxed effectively. It's called a retrospective premium to pay the output of the, the, the cost of that litigation up to a cap uh, with the opportunity for Congress to intervene if the, uh, if the liability is in excess of the cap as to whether they're going to uh, provide recoveries uh, for people who have damages that are cumulatively total more than the cap. Um, the the trade-off you have to make is in the absence of Price Anderson, and it isn't as if there is an infinite resource that is available. What would happen is there was a serious accident that you would get the up, you could recover up to the capacity of the company to pay, and then there's no more money, and the company would go bankrupt. So you have a, an inherent limitation in the, uh, the, the alternative system. What Price Anderson does is in trade for a cap, is it requires, imposes this obligation on every licensee to contribute if there is an accident at any reactor. And it's a way to spread, even though you know, it may mean there's a licensee has no uh, culpability for the accident, no connection to the accident, it is still required to pay into this pool to pay for the liability expenses. So uh, you know, you're going to have a debate as to whether which system works. And I know that a lot of people in other industries have wondered whether they ought to have a Price Anderson type scheme in order to assure a pool of money that will be uh, sufficient to be able to pay the actual damages that occur. Because the risk otherwise is that the company that is, is culpable will just go up, go bankrupt, and there will be no money to pay a lot of the claims. Well, with, that's why there's a cap. Is that you can't have an infinite amount. The public is actually back in yeah. the power. That's what I'm saying. It's not legal. Well, I mean, I've described how it's supposed to work. It's a way to deal with the liability associated with this and other uh, enterprises that have similar risks associated with them or the possibility of very severe accidents have looked at this scheme as being a model because at least it spreads the capacity to, play, to pay over a much larger group of people in return for something they get, which is uh, a cap on their liability. And whether that's a subsidy or not is a question. Can I just actually follow up with a comment and two questions? Uh, um, uh, the comment earlier you said about how nuclear does not have the uh, subsidies of other technologies, but you did not mention the, lo the large loan guarantees that nuclear does have. It does have, uh, yes. And uh, maybe you might want to comment on those. Uh, then I have actually yeah. two questions on proliferation, one domestic and one international. Uh, domestically, there is this argument driven by new enrichment technology as to whether or not the NRC should have proliferation as a consideration in its licensing. Yeah. Uh, and the commission seems to be resistant to that idea, and I'd like your view on that. And then internationally, uh, with the IAEA, uh, some, some think the NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty, is kind of overtaken by technology and one has the threshold problem uh, in terms of enrichment and fuel cycle, what can be done on that, barring a new, a, a new treaty, if any. Yeah. I should have mentioned the Loan Guarantee Program. There is Energy Policy Act of 2005 uh, did provide for the capacity of the federal government to provide guarantees for loans for the construction of nuclear power plants. And I can't remember the now, but it was in the order of 20 billion, I think, that was authorized for that program. Eight something for vocal for, for Georgia, I think. Yes, yeah, a, a total of 20 billion, of which they've issued loan guarantees of in the order of eight. The program has not worked very well for a variety of reasons. Among them is that uh, uh, OMB, the licensees would claim that OMB has uh, sought to assure that in giving the loan guarantees, the licensees pay effectively the commercial cost of getting that insurance. 
So it doesn't actually act as a subsidy. It actually, is, it's, the way it's worked is it's, it's worked as it's, it's killed some deals because they'd assume they would get a loan guarantee and it just proved to be too expensive because these were risky projects and the loan guarantee terms were not sufficient to allow them to go forward. Um, there is a, uh, and OMB inherently hates loan guarantees, so they, they were not necessarily enthused about this program to start with. But there's a, a large pot of money that in principle is there. They did, or are planning to give, I think it's actually still unresolved, but they've said they'll give a loan guarantee for the Vogel plant. Um, I don't think it's quite happened yet, but the interesting thing to me was that the licensee in that case said they were pleased to get the loan guarantee, but they really didn't need it because they were able to proceed without it. So I've always wondered why the federal government thought there was a great triumph to give them a loan guarantee when they said they would have proceeded if they would not received one. So this is not a program that's working well. There are loan guarantee authorities at much lower levels that have been available for some of the solar technologies, but it's nowhere near the scale. The program basically hasn't worked. Now, um, you asked about the uh, proliferation issues. The issue arises because uh, General Electric has a laser enrichment process that um, which it syndicated it plans to construct in the United States. It's actually a technology that was initially pursued by DOE. Uh, decision was made that it was going to be impossible to make it commercially viable. And the Australians allegedly have made it possible for this to succeed commercially. It has raised concern in the proliferation community because it promises to be a technology that would have a very small footprint and greatly reduced power demands for the enrichment of uranium, which from a proliferation point of view provides a challenge in that you can't count on a large facility drawing a lot of power as, a, as an indication that somebody has built an illegal or un, un, unjustified enrichment facility and what are they up to with it? Is it for proliferation purposes is obviously the concern. Um, in what I view as a, a mistake by the NRC, there was a comment in a final environmental impact statement that was associated with this technology where the NRC said, we don't worry about proliferation when we give licenses. Uh, I don't think that's what was exactly intended. The NRC is required not only to provide <laughs> adequate protection of the public health and safety, but is also required to assure the common defense and security which I would have interpreted to include worry about proliferation issues with these technologies. So there is some controversy about exactly what the NRC meant. Uh, the American Physical Society has, uh, has, has submitted a petition for a rulemaking to ask for the NRC to change its regulations to require a proliferation impact assessment to, to be a counterpart of an environmental impact statement. Uh, which I believe is still under consideration by the NRC. I'm not sure that's the right way to deal with this issue, but I certainly think this is an issue the NRC should confront with regard to any license they give, is that they should worry about proliferation. Your final question was about the, uh, the uh, NTP and uh, the non -proliferation, non -proliferation, NPT and the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, and whether it's adequate to the times. Um, you know, this is, uh, the question is what can you get in this world? Uh, a change, I think it would be wonderful if we had a stronger NPT. Uh, whether it's possible to achieve it where we have such divisions between the developing world and particularly the weapon states uh, is, uh, is it's hard to imagine we're going to do much better. There are certainly some problems with the regime, although as creaky as it is, there have been a large number of people who started down on the path of building weapons and they've been discouraged or prevented from doing so and have retreated. Uh, we're in a obviously a very troubling time now with events that are unfolding before our eyes now with North Korea uh, and uh, and uh, of course uh, Iran as well. So I mean that we clearly have some challenges that with the, the operation of the regime 
the treaty itself isn't going to prevent things. It's going to be a lot of muscle that's applied by other countries to try to bring these countries along the lines that, that they have some interests in assuring that nonproliferation objectives are achieved. But the treaty by itself isn't, isn't the means or the vehicle for doing that. Two more questions, Steve? Sure. You mentioned the Finns having ordered a second reactor, and uh, it is an impressive display of optimism, too, <laughs> given that the, over experience. the <laughs> current one is so far overdue, and they just announced that it's delayed even more. What I'm curious if you can comment on is in the dispute with Arriva, Arriva has pointed out that they are succeeding in contracting, constructing their plants on time in China. What's going on there? Is, do you have any sense of that? I don't. Um, I mean, the circumstance, and I don't really know what's happening there. Um, my understanding is, is that Arriva took on the responsibility for construction in Finland, whereas the construction, the, the experienced entity in France for constructing nuclear plants was EDF. And Arriva was into basically uh, taking on a responsibility there that it, it, although there are a lot of Arriva plants obviously in France, they hadn't actually done the construction of them, uh, so the full construction of them. So they were took on a lot of responsibilities and they clearly did not adequately understand the Finnish regulatory system, which is much more like the U.S., in some respects more strict than the U.S., than is the case in France. This is the things that they would have been gotten a pass on from a regulatory port in France. They discovered that the Finns, Stuck is the name of the regulatory agency, expect, expected to see documents before they proceeded to prove that this was appropriate. And Arriva was not aware that that was going to be part of the, the, the game here. I don't know enough. I think that their Flammaville plan has been similarly, has been delayed even though EDF is doing the construction there. Uh, I don't know the, the details of it and how things are going in France. One last question. Yeah, you've spoken a lot about the importance of the regulatory systems, and on your list of emerging nuclear countries, you didn't include China or India. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about what the regulatory system looks like there, uh, whether as far as confidence in you or not. Um, yeah, I obviously China and India are not emerging countries, so that's why they weren't listed on that slide. But there are varying capacities of regulators around the world. Uh, and I think that one has reason to worry about China and India. Uh, that they're, the regulator in China, I know, is very weak. Uh, the people are paid much less than the uh, people of equivalent experience on the licensees, and that has an inevitable impact on who you can recruit. Their regulatory challenges is very large because they have Chinese strategy has been to buy one or two of every design. So they have a much more diverse fleet that they have to regulate. And to regulate them, you really need to understand them. And to have all this diversity makes it they have a harder regulatory program problem than I think any other regulator in the world. And they don't have the competence or capacity to really do that well. So with that glum note, thank you all very much. <laughs>